Just before we attempt our one and only panel of this conference, I, I want to ask you about this astonishing figure that comes up in your book, $17 trillion. So if I can explain it to those of you who haven't read the book. Um, there's a suggestion there that for this merger to occur, the wealthier country will pay the citizens of the less wealthy country an amount to what sounds like buying the country. So no, for their over-contribution and assets to the partnership is how I put it. It's an okay. investment banking model. Okay, for their <laughs> over-contribution. But think about it. Instead of invading another country, why don't you just buy it? And so the number that is set in this book is $500,000 per Canadian citizen. And I had a spasm there because I thought, if I put the question to you, how many of you would turn down $500,000? Let's see it. $500,000 well, to join Well, Moses, Moses, Not to right? be fair, no, wait, wait, wait. The $500,000 quantifies the per person assets Canadians have over and above what Americans have. So it would be worth that, but oil and gas isn't worth as much as it used to be when I did that calculation. Okay, so we're gonna call up the professor and Conrad, please. And could we put up, yes, this is one of my favorite cartoons. I've had it for a while and those of us in the media business are constantly <laughs> having to deal with questions of identity, Canadian content and so on. So if the worthy panel could examine this cartoon, we can begin our conversation. What is the precipitating crisis, in your opinion, that could actually lead to this kind of combination? Well, that's my thesis. They may not agree that any right. crisis would bring that about. Um, and I'm not sure any crisis would, but I think there would have to be a, um, a, 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 a public opinion on both sides of the border that this is something that has to be done or is desirable to do. What could precipitate that? I mean, obviously, East and West Germany would never have united and gone through all the hassle of that if East Germany hadn't been left an orphan and gone bankrupt. I sometimes read the occasional paranoid tome which talks about the need for water, for example. Is it possible that water could become... Well, the water thing is very interesting, and it's been a real uh, paranoia on the part of Canadian nationalists, but... Uh, the fact of the matter is that um, my information from the people that I now, I'm, I'm now with a university down in Silicon Valley uh, part-time is that the solar, solar this year has reached, rooftop solar in the United States is grid parity in price with oil and gas produced electricity. So you're going to start to see a wholesale shift to that. California is the leader in Germany, interestingly enough. Uh, solar power makes it possible to desalinate the oceans. Water is not going to be a problem. The fact that we own 20% of the world's fresh water supply is not an asset that we can rely on. Yeah, the United States has more than enough water, it's just not in the right bits. Conrad, what do you make of Diane's argument? I don't agree with her conclusion. I'm in favor of free trade, and I certainly agree that we have to maintain good relations with the U.S. In general, I think Canadians would not wish to join the U.S. as long as they believed that this was, in fact, a better governed country. And, in fact, it is a better governed country. And I think Canadians rightly feel that there is too much violence in the U.S., that the political system is too corrupt, and the justice system is completely unreliable, and I know something about that, and it is. <laughs> it has a... It, it, it has a 99% conviction rate, compared to 61% in this country and 50% in Britain. It has 5% of the world's population, 25% of its incarcerated people, and 50% of its lawyers who take 10% of GDP. Exceptionalism in the U.S. is, as you said, Diane, a matter of scale. And as you said it too, Frank, it's a matter of scale. There's never in the history of the world been a country that operates on that scale. But as Frank put it in one of our TV programs on your channel, Moses, 
uh, when he moved from Canada to the US, he moved from the world's best country to the world's greatest country. And they're both great countries, and they're both good countries, but they are, as Diane said, very different. And I don't buy all your statistics, Diane. I, 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 you know, there are a number of them that I don't agree with. But we don't want to antagonize the Americans. We need to get on well with them. They are a great country. But we can actually run a better political society here while getting all the benefits of proximity to the US. But we've got to pull our weight in the alliance. You're right. Our, our defense capability should be much greater than it is. We've got to stop piggybacking and leeching off the United States. We have to behave like a great country because we are one, I think. Frank, you look well, like you're... Uh, th this was a splendid argument. I thought there was only one flaw in it, and that is that I couldn't imagine any American who would give two cents for Canada. I mean, it's, it's not the case that Americans pay any attention to any other country in the world unless that country attacks it. And therefore, I have a suggestion for that crisis that she's yearning for. <laughs> Given Obama's... Uh, Sounds Merovingian like thing on uh, foreign right. policy, I suggest we build a goddamn pipeline anyway, as if they're going to stop us. There's your crisis. Yeah, well, no. Um, <laughs> so the, the whole idea of the thought experiment was to shake Americans into realizing that we lived in this extremely wealthy, desirable place. And for Canadians to realize that, you know, they've got a lot that they could develop, and they're not that's still on the table. And so it was partly that. It was just part of the thought experiment. Of course, the Americans wouldn't pay, pay uh, $17 trillion to acquire Canada. But I think that uh, I don't want them to get it for nothing, either. Hey, Moses, may I say one thing? Please. I actually, Diane, you may not know this. I wrote an article in Foreign Affairs, you know, the magazine of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, about uh, 25 years ago, when the Canadian dollar was 65 cents saying this is America's chance. We had polls showing over 20% of Canadians would like to just join the US. And, and, I, and I said, look, I'm not an advocate of this, but the fact is, if I were an American strategic thinker, I would propose offering Canada parity in the dollar, which, by the way, comparisons with Germany are a bit much. That country was only divided because they, you know, they had Hitler as leader and lost war against all civilized countries. And, and the, their, their enemies occupied every square millimeter of Germany. But the uh, offer parity, as Helmut Kohl did to East Germany, and say Canada can keep its medical care system, not that I am quite as enthused about that system as most Canadians are, but keep that. And, and keep control of residential immigration uh, to avoid, we have to put all this delicately, but as you have done in some of your phrasing, you know, complicated American sociology. We don't have a legacy of slavery and we don't want to import it. But that's not a, that's not a wrap on any individual group, it's a, a condition. And do that and make that offer and Canadians might well take it. But, that I could see at that time, particularly at a time when the federal government of Canada was, I thought, abasing itself in front of the Quebec nationalists. And I thought we could make a better deal with the United States than, than with the Quebec separatists. I mean, the U.S. is the greatest country in the world, and the Quebec separatists are a ragtag of myth makers and quasi-fascists. <laughs> There's, I think, never been a time in the last 25 or 30 years when Diane's proposal would find fewer friends amongst the Americans. The uh, hostility to free trade now, now seen in uh, Hillary's embrace of, of opponents to the uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Deal is, is extraordinarily strong. And there is this weird connection of uh, weird people on the right and, and, and the bulk of the Democratic Party at this particular point, opposed to not just the Trans-Pacific trade deal, but, but, but NAFTA is a matter of regret. And so you can expect that to continue to be chipped back. And, and uh, we should be lucky, in other words, to hold on to that which, which we have. Here's, so. here's the nuanced version that I, I believe. You say NAFTA to an American, they think Mexico drug dealing, poor people, taking my jobs, pumping gas. They don't think Canada. They don't think enough about Canada. One of the things and reasons I wrote this book was to say, look, 
let's do something asymmetrical. You still keep Canada, NAFTA. But you do, you know, I, I would submit that we would have gone more toward a customs union by now if Mexico hadn't begged to get in in 94, then promptly went bankrupt and created all kinds of other problems. So there is, and, and Europe indeed uh, developed that way too. It started off with six, then it went to 10 countries and so on, and then they brought in the poorer ones, the more difficult ones down the road after they bootstrapped them. So that's my, my idea, and I think that we have, a, we have the same institutions, both strong institutions. I'm talking institutions from the point of view of economic free trade. And, and we're getting there. It's already happening quite dramatically. Um, and, and I think that it was really interesting for Americans to go, oh, yeah, sure, Canada. It's a diff we're, we're, Canada is not treated like Mexico as a foreign country. It's considered another country. If you could make that merger from the U.S. standpoint, it would be, in resources terms, a born-again country. It would double its resources and, and only add 10 percent to its population. Uh, that would be a good deal for them. I, I agree with Frank. American politics are now so complicated by, by a succession of inept presidents and... and uh, I left because of American yeah. politics. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, I knew Mr. Francis, and I knew what you left for. But the, um, uh, <laughs> a very nice fellow he was too. But uh, the, um, I, I just, I, I have to say, Diane, you know, I did a lot of research on our prime ministers, and I went through virtually everything that Robert Borden and, and Mackenzie King wrote and said, and they never said anything about joining the US. But I agree with you uh, on the economic side, and I was a great supporter of free trade, and I think it's been a good thing for Canada because it showed Canadians they could compete. And for a time, the American component of our GDP went up, but now as China and India are putting up proper economic growth rates, uh, and, and it, it becomes a mixed resource country's market, that, that level of integration is coming down. I, I, I agree with you, but economic union doesn't make political union, and that's the lesson of Europe. It's a two-speed Europe. There's a German bloc, there's a Mediterranean bloc that is not a hard currency area, and there are independent countries like Britain that are hard currency areas, but aren't integrated, but are in the common market. And it works, but every country has to work it out for itself. The last thing I'd say is, you can pile onto the Mexicans all you want, but they wouldn't have the problems that they do if the U.S. hadn't pushed this absurd drug war on them. A trillion dollars. A, a trillion dollars, a million people imprisoned, and drugs are more available, higher quality, and, and more cheaply priced now than they ever were. And, and everybody is bribed. If the U.S. really wanted to keep imported drugs out of the U.S., the country is, as Frank said, that has every gun in the room with the greatest military establishment in the world and greater than all other countries combined, could do it without retarding legitimate tourists or legitimate commerce five minutes. And they don't do it. The last word, Frank? Well, I moved to the United States 25 years ago, as, Con as uh, Conrad noted, from the best to the greatest country in the world. The similarities are very strong, but the longer I stay there, the differences become greater in my mind. All right. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you.